Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, good evening. This evening we're going to talk about free will. It's free because God gave it to us. See? Some people don't know what free means. See? Some people think that free means that I can do what I please. But that's an illusion, isn't it? Huh? You can't do as you please. You get in the car and you ride, you're riding and the, and the light turns red. What's red? What's the difference between red, green, yellow, pink, blue? But something tells you, you got to stop. Who said you have to stop when it turns red? Well, the law, the city, the nation, whatever. What happens when you're going on a highway and it says 55, 60, and you decide to go 70, 75? The very fact that you have these little contraptions on your dashboard, you know, they go beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. One of the most dishonest things I think that, that, that's ever alive. Beep, beep, beep. What's it doing? It says, now you've been doing your own will. But there's a little brown bear around the corner. <laughs> and this little brown bear is in a car. And what he's going to do, he's going to take his little gadget and go this way, and he's going to know you're going 80. What's he going to do? He's going to stop you. So much for free will, the way we understand it. Free will means that it is a God-given gift. If I give you something, then you didn't have it before. Neither did you have a right to it. If I give you a necktie, there must be something else you can buy men, though. But I gave you a necktie, you, would, you didn't have it before, and so it wasn't yours. It's only because I gave it to you that it's yours. So it's what? Free. See, Christmas time is a time for free gifts, except for the guy who paid for them. See, uh, that wasn't too free for him. But all the children get boats and little cars and all this. It's free for them. So free will also indicates that if your father bought you a car, free will, meaning this free car, you have a responsibility. You can't run down the road and wrap it around a tree. See, because what happened? You have misused something free. You have misused a gratuitous gift given out of love to be a vehicle of transportation, not a vehicle to wrap around trees. Now, nobody passing the, a car wrapped around a tree would say, oh, fancy that. I wonder why he wanted to do that. You see, misuse of will wrapped him around a tree. Misuse of the car wrapped him around a tree. So we have to know when we go around saying, I have free choice, free will, everything is free. Oh, if it's free, somebody gave it to you. 
somebody had to give you this gift. You just didn't go out and all of a sudden there's a big car in front of your house that says, free gift, big ribbon. Somebody that had much more than you do, much more generous perhaps than you are, decided, here's a gift for you. So when we look about free will, we know it has attached to it a sense of responsibility. Free meaning I can make a choice, I can misuse it, but so can I misuse a car. See, somebody may give you a tie and you, you spill acid on it. You misused a gift. But how is it that we don't understand that I can misuse my will? So everybody thinks today, in fact, that I have a will, I have the right to do what I want with it. In a way, yes. Meaning it's yours, so if you want to pour acid on your tie, go ahead. But what happened? You destroy the gift. You have no more gift. You know, that car around the tree doesn't automatically unwind and you just take off again. So what happened? There's a, a responsibility there. So when we have free will, we know it is a gift. It isn't a gift, however, you can give yourself. You see, because it is a part of a higher nature than you. You're kind of animal nature, you don't want to think that, but you, what is it? We work kind of, without the free will, without memory, intellect, and will, we are the most stupid of all God's animals. Nobody wants to say we are an animal, but we are, we're part animal and part angelic, spiritual. But nobody's going to think that, well, if I have free will, you know, I can misuse it, it's mine. That's true. But when I say that, I have to take the consequences of that thought. I have to remember that my free will is a gift from who? The one who is will. Can only give you and me a little portion of it. So I, my will comes from God. So it is free and it is from God. It is from God. Now we begin to see that although it's free, meaning gift, will, meaning from God. Now somehow in between here, we have to understand that I am a responsible individual. I got to be a responsible individual that acknowledges a gift and it also acknowledges it is from God now, if I do these two things, who do I obey? Who do I obey? Now, you say, well, what's obedience got to do with it? Everything. Obedience is the exercise of my will. You're always going to do somebody's will. You're kidding yourself if you think you're going to go around doing always your own will. That's, that's ridiculous. You're always doing somebody. You don't go to your employer. You don't go to your vice president and say, um, I, let me tell you what I'm going to do today. I'm going to work two hours, and then I'm going to uh, go downtown and have a, a nice long lunch. I'll see you at 3 o'clock. What do you think of that? You're nodding your head, huh? It wouldn't work? You don't think it would work? No. Why wouldn't it work? Ooh. Because you know your vice president, right? <laughs> you know your employer, and you know that you are under her, and the very fact you accepted a job says, you're my superior. And like the centurion said to the Lord, I am also head of, of men. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to one, come, and he comes. I said, I don't want to meet that guy. You know? So the the... The human will is a gift. Where from? It is from God. 
Now, I have to obey God because he gave me the gift. It's a part of him. Unlike a tie or a car, that's not a part of your father. It's something exterior. But when God gave me free will, he gave me a part of himself. He gave me a part of himself. And that's what we defile. We defile the part of God in me when I do against his will. It's not only a matter of free choice, free will. It's a matter that I am a part of God himself, has planted a memory in me, an intellect, and a will. All of this is what makes you human with your body. The body alone is animal, a very stupid animal. How long do you have to wait before you can even say, oh, I will, I don't will, I don't like it, I like it? I told you, I, my, the first words I remember ever saying when I was three years old, I told my mother, my grandmother, who was constantly picking on my mother, uh, that's my father's mother, unfortunately. Uh, and I told her, oh, shut up. You all time talk, talk. <laughs> and I can see that oven. She was right before a, a little one of these uh, uh, stoves that had a burner here and an oven here, you know. And, and, uh, and the door was open. I can see it right now. The door was open. And my mother was putting a roast chicken in the oven. And my grandmother had the knack of deboning a chicken before you put it in the oven and make it still look like a chicken. If I deboned a chicken, it would be unrecognizable. <laughs> but she had that talent, my mother didn't. So the argument was, why didn't you debone the chicken? And my mother was saying, so what? You're gonna eat it off the bone anyway. So between the two of them, I looked at my grandmother and I said, oh, shut up, you all the time talk, talk. I'm three years old. And I'm already shutting somebody up. <laughs> <coughs> so you see, I had a memory, intellect, and will. I probably thought this woman never keeps her trap shut. And at some point I decided somebody's going to tell her something. And I did it. <laughs> I did it. And so the, the, that is what makes me what? Like who? Like a chimpanzee? Oh, just because he knows he can pick an apple from this vehicle if you pat him on the back end, and you pick a pear from this one if you pat him on the front end, then he's intelligent. There's nobody like you. Why? Because you're made to the image of God. So, free will, and our free will. What do you do when you gotta make a choice? Is it free then? Oh sure, you can say no to God. When you, miss will, when you misuse your will, and you say no to God, we call that sin. We say no to God. We say no. I'm not going to keep your commandments. I don't want you to be pure spirit. I want you to be a she. I want to say mother God. See, the point that we don't, we're missing all together is we're, 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 we're doing a battle of wills here. And what we're saying is that this free gift from God is all mine now. He can drop out of the picture. But you see, that free will is a part of him. He can't drop out of the picture. He can't. 
So when you say no to God, then you are adverse to his will, and we call that sin. You see, that's why sin is such an abomination to God. And we say, well, you offend God. Well, I don't offend him, meaning he's lost some happiness because of me. He's not less joyful because of me. <clears throat> what did I do? I took a part of him in me, and I threw it in a garbage can. I put acid on the tie, I wrap a car on the tree. That's how I offend God. I take a part of him in me, and I say, I don't want it this way. I want it another way. I want this another way. So I am free to do what I will. However, when I do what I will against the will of God that is within me, then I have to take the consequences. That's the consequences is what we rebel against, isn't it, huh? See, I want to be able to do, I want to be able to do my own will with no consequences. <coughs> if a man up on the telephone pole doesn't watch that live wire, if he doesn't think, you know, oh, I, hey, I'm a good electrician, I know what I'm doing. And he gets careless. Or his boss on the bottom says, no, don't touch that. And he does it anyway. He's got to take the consequences. And they're immediate. Well, unfortunately, when I go against the will of God, the consequences are not always apparent. No more than they're apparent if you begin to smoke. You begin to smoke, you smoke one cigarette a day, two, three, it's not apparent. You smoke a pack a day, it's nothing. I mean, you're, you're in good shape. You smoke two packs a day, well, a little harder to breathe, but hey, what's the difference, you know? You're, you're in good shape, you're able to navigate. Now you come up to two and a half packs, a little out of breath, going up steps. Some people will not take the consequences. All of a sudden, 20 years pass. You got the picture? 20 years pass. And doctors have said, don't smoke. It's going to be bad for your lung. You could get cancer. You get all these billboards. You know these billboards, huh? It's amazing how we influence people's will, not to good, but to bad. Have this magnificent scene of green grass and the cool breeze, you got a, a big tree, and that you can see that tree kind of moving in the wind. And it's advertising cool. See, some kind of mentholatum uh, cigarette. <laughs> you know, like it, that suddenly when you take this particular cigarette, you're gonna be uh, just uh, almost within the freshest air there is. Ah, oh, underneath, in the corner, Way in the corner. The general surgeon says, if you smoke this, you're nuts. <laughs> because you could very well get cancer. See, you see the, the, what happens that we, we, we pretend that this is what's gonna happen, and this is the end result of smoking this kind of cigarette. But we've already been warned, huh? But my will, I have taken unto myself. Whoops. I have taken my will unto myself. Then I have to take all the consequences. That's what's so unpleasant. When we get rid of commandments, when we get rid of precepts, and, and those in the Catholic Church, when they get rid of all the magisterium and the Pope doesn't know what he's doing and this 
this doesn't know what they're doing and and we're going to do our own thing and 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 we don't like the way we do it we're going to change this we're going to change that all of this we're going to and we all suffer from the consequences of all that today some young student a high school student or whatever decides that they want to be in the in group and so they begin to smoke first marijuana then heroin the first thing you know, they're sunk. Because somebody said, oh, go on. You can do your own thing. You know, what's the difference? Well, once you do your own thing only, you don't suffer consequences. Now, a lot of people say today that the church, it doesn't have to be the Catholic church, any church, takes away your free will. Now, when we say that, you see, we have forgotten the formula we put up here before. The church does, cannot take away your free will. The church presents, presents faith and morals teaching. That's what it does. It presents faith and moral teaching. You're still free to say, I don't want to do that. There's nobody taking away your free will. It presents to you. It is bound to present to you. I say to thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Go out and teach all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You cannot teach error in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It would be to call God a liar. Or someone who changes his will every five minutes. There has to be a source of truth. Otherwise, how would you know what God expects from you on moral issues and faith issues? Ethics? Does everybody do their own will? Meaning, well, my opinion is as good as your opinion. Well, I don't question opinions. No, we don't talk about opinions. Sure, everybody's opinions is equal. We're not talking about opinions. You can think anything you want. That's in the intellect. Some of you listening don't agree with me at all. Some of you turn it off. Some of you say, well, I'll go on. Maybe she'll say something interesting. So there's, there's no way that you, God would die for you, send his son, live among us in poverty, in, in pain, in suffering, die on the cross, rise from the dead without a source of truth. You mean he's going to do all of that and just leave you to believe every kind of wind of doctrine? Isn't that what St. Paul said? Men will have itching ears. You know what itching ears is? I go to any church, and when that church says what I want to hear, that's the one I join. If they change, you run to another church. A man told me one time, I said, uh, yeah, are you going to you going to sacraments? Oh, yeah. I was a little suspicious. You know, you get a little bit suspicious, you know, and I said, well, if you change your life, Oh, hell no, he said, I didn't change my life. <laughs> I said, that's what I thought he didn't change his life. I said, tell me, how do you go to confession? Well, he said, it took me a long time to find a priest that said what I did was okay. <laughs> oh, you see, that's not a confession. That's not a confession, that's a politician. That's someone who has itching ears, goes to someone to say, I want you to say what I want to hear. God can't do that because God is truth. He can't change the truth. 
the truth is the truth. Now we have different variations. We may have different interpretations. But if he says this, this is moral and this is not, that's the truth. The commandments are not something that you, um, that are imposed upon you uh, to make you frustrated, to take away your will. Thou shalt not. It's no different than those guarantees you get. You can't put sand in your carburetor and then go back and complain to the dealer. Can you do that? No? I like somebody to try it. <laughs> What he'd say is, hey, <laughs> this carburetor is not made for sand. See? You, you, whatever has been guaranteed, whatever you buy is guaranteed, but it's only guaranteed if you follow what? What? Instructions. Instructions. Now, why is it we take the instructions of a, uh, a manufacturer in our stride. Hmm? But the instructions of God, who is truth, when he says, this is not moral, this is going to hurt your body. This is not good for the machine I made. When he says that, if you go against that, fine, you have the will to go against. But remember, you cannot expect God to be dishonest, disloyal, or evil to suit your will. He is all holy, all infinite, all wonderful, all majestic, all truth. He cannot change. Today we seem to think that we live in this very special modern technical age that we're free to do everything and anything we want to do. You see, that, that's a terrible indictment against God's gift of will to us. So when I, when I say God is truth, the church is bound to present that truth. The church presents the truth. If you go against it, you suffer the consequences. But because he is truth, he is bound to tell you. If you do all of these things, you will run quite well. Not only that, you will gain eternal life. If you don't do these things, then you will not gain eternal life. And none of you parents would allow your children to come in a brand new house, a beautiful house, brand new carpet, and then come in with a motorcycle in the middle of the living room and uh, begin to uh, change the oil. Yeah, you, oh, look at you, just imagining that, huh? Huh? Do you think those parents would have the ability or the right to throw both the motorcycle and the child right out the window? Huh? You think he would? You think so, huh? Then why is it we think God doesn't have the right to let us suffer from our consequences of sin, of going against his will. So you can say free choice all you want. Meaning, I, all that says is I can sin. Well, everybody knows that. You don't have to carry a big sign and say I'm for free choice. Adam and Eve went for free choice. Look what happened to them. I am for free choice. That's not a statement. That's a fact. Everybody is, for, is choosing freedom, love, peace, joy. It has to be within the context of the will of God. You see, one of our problems uh, that we have anyway, and most people have, that we have a hard time uh, after we sin to keep from falling into despair. See? 
because if God guides our steps and he watches over us and we fall, then we can't understand sometimes that God himself understands our weaknesses. He knows we're going to vary and veer from the truth. And he, that's what the, the, the parable of the prodigal son is. The parable of the prodigal son manifests very clearly two wills. The father's will and the young man's will. The young man said, hey, I'm tired of farming. Give me my inheritance now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere and buy me a condo and have a good time. So the father says, well, I can't stop you. What? What was that? Free will. See, he knew. He had this inheritance. He belonged to this son. What happens? He said, okay, I, there's nothing I can do. I don't want you to go. I think you're going to get in trouble. I think you're going to squander this. I know it. I'm of age. I know what I'm doing. Don't bother me. Okay. So he goes. Well, he does squander. He's got all kinds of friends. When I was a kid sometime, I'd bring candy to school. And um, when I brought that candy to school, I was the most popular kid in the class. But because of my obnoxious disposition at the time, without the candy, I was a nothing. You see? If they saw me can coming and I didn't have a bag of candy, forget it. See? So I'm trying to buy something that was not mine. Well, that's how kind of we kind of do with the Lord, you know? We try to, we think we're going we're gonna to buy something. I'm going to do this, but then I expect you to do that for me. I'm going to do your will. I want a little recompense here. I want a little reward. I want to be able to do this. A kind of a tit for tat thing. Today I do your will. Tomorrow you do my will. Today I do, I do your will. Tomorrow you do my will. Not like that. Because God is truth. Because he is holiness. Because he wants you and I to be holy. He wants you and I to be good. He wants you and I always to live in his presence. Because of that, he cannot tolerate the slightest trace of evil. You know what the sin against the Holy Spirit is? The sin against the Holy Spirit, our Lord said, was to attribute to Satan what is of God. Mm -hmm. Why did they do that? Didn't they do that to the Lord? He said, by Beelzebub, do you do all these miracles? So they attributed evil to the workings of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. See how terrible that is? Well, we don't do that as graphically as that. And we don't sin against the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, then I can't say it's seldom anymore, but it seems like it should be seldom. However, when I go against the will of God, against what makes this holy and good and live forever, then I'm not only going to suffer the consequences, I'm going to have to look at myself. And what do we call that? Conscience. It says, ah, you shouldn't have done that. See? There's that little conscience inside. I can bury it and I can kill it. But that little conscience is given to me by God to, to help me to know his will in circumstances that we don't know. You've all had that experience that you're in a situation and you know maybe that this is a no-no and all of a sudden your conscience begins to bother you and you know for sure now we go against that. Well, then we got to take the contrary. I am free to, to say no even to God. The church cannot take your will away. That <laughs> God would have to annihilate you to take away your will. The church cannot take your will away because it presents 
right from wrong. Today everybody thinks that we are right and wrong is up for debate. Make a choice. I'll give you right, and then I'll give you wrong, and now you take what you want. That is not the truth. The church has to say, this is faith, and this is moral, this is ethical, and that's it. You're the one that says no. But you can't run around and say the church is going to give you a choice of abortion, for example. Give, give you a choice. If the church says it's wrong, it's because God said it's wrong. God says it's wrong. Under every circumstance, it's wrong. We have a great audience tonight, and, and uh, so we're going to have audience questions because they never get a chance to say anything. So, who has a question? You. All right? Mother, suppose you have a decision or a choice to make, and it's an important one, and you want to do God's will, but you don't know what it is, and you're struggling with the answer. How do you go about making that choice? Well, there again, if we're talking about moral or, or faith, choices in faith and morals and ethics, we can know for sure what God wills. If you're talking about other things, you know, if you pray and you depend on the Spirit and you have a kind of rule of thumb, it's a decision I have to make now for the honor and glory of God. Is it for the good of my neighbor? Will my neighbor be benefited or harmed? And will it enhance my uh, eternal salvation? See? Now we put ourselves last, not because we're humble, but because that's the commandment. The commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, your neighbor as God loves him, not as yourself. But a lot of people love me as themselves. They wouldn't be loved at all. You know that. Some people hate themselves. How are they going to love me? Or you, or whoever. So the new commandment is that I love in the way God loves. So with free will, we're able to decide by that rule of thumb. Is it for the honor and glory of God? Uh, if it, is it for the good of my neighbor benefit? Or will they not benefit? For example, will my family benefit or will they be scandalized? Will my parents be deeply offended? See, a lot of people, they just go and act. They don't think about what's going to happen when I do this to my family, my friends, my loved ones. See? Then, is it going to benefit not me here in this life, but in eternal life? Now, these all will come under, most of those kind of things come under faith, moral, ethics. Now, if you're trying to decide whether you should buy a Cadillac or a Volkswagen, then you just need common sense. <laughs> See, the, like the Lord, don't forget, many of our decisions come from something our Lord already gave us, a memory, intellect, and will. He's not going to send an angel to you and say, I wouldn't buy that car, you see. It don't look too good to me. <laughs> I mean, I would definitely go for something bigger. <laughs> no, he's not going to do that. Because what did he do? He gave me what? A part of himself, didn't he? And that part of himself makes, makes me understand, decide, discern. So if I discern, then my pocketbook is uh, on the scooter level. See, I don't know what you call them today. In my day, they call them scooters. And I go into a, a Cadillac dealership. See, now there's something wrong, isn't there? I may want that very badly. But the, the, the memory, intellect, and will that the Lord gave me is already a gift from God that says to me, common sense, I wouldn't do that. I'd get roller skates if I were you. See? So you have, it all depends, you know. That's why I say often, over and over, we need a source of truth a source of truth. Have you understood, you know, a source 
of truth. You know, you get so many churches today, they're arguing about something they should never argue about. You can't even believe they're talking about it. You know, should we have a bishop that's a lesbian or a bishop that's gay? Or what, what, I, I, you just can't, you look and you say, I don't believe this. This is a church. Or a church comes out and says, we're for abortion. You see, that doesn't make sense if they know anything about the Bible. That they don't teach what the Bible says. See, just because the Catholic Church is so verbal, doesn't mean most and many Protestant churches believe exactly what the Catholic teach, teach. We don't. We're not together on sacraments. But moral life, we are. We used, we used to be. Now you don't know where they're at or where we're at. So it all depends. See, now if you were to say to your mother, "Should I buy uh, two or three condoms?" Condominium, God save us. <laughs> 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 oh, well. <laughs> That's what happens when you're live. You see, you just have no control. But I did, it, was, it, was, it was worth the laugh. <laughs> if you want to say, should I buy... <laughs> three condominiums <laughs> <laughs> then I would I would say well you know what do you got in the bank and you know can you afford to keep them and can you sell them? all this kind of thing see that that be an easy decision to make okay did I answer your question <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> Mother, I have yeah. uh, the exact question on the, the discernment uh, of God's will from our own. Mm -hmm. But as a follow-up, uh, in what ways in our daily lives with the confusing confusion in the world mm -hmm. today, can we uh, make ourselves, practice, practically speaking, open ourselves more open to the will of God? Very hard today, you see. It shouldn't be. See, if you adhere to the teachings of the church, which we call magisterium, you know full well what the Lord wants and what he teaches, see. However, we do have uh, prophets who say other things than what the Lord has said in the church, you see. And that's the problem. Because most Christians say if a minister says it or a priest says it or a nun says it, it's true. Well, I wish it were. But there the discernment is not so much what is said, but who says it. I think that's where our discernment has to start today. Who says it? Then I can discern what they say. We don't discern at all who says anything. We just, we're like gold, we're like a, oh, can't even think of it, like an empty cistern and all this garbage and dirt and all this comes in and we, oh yeah, 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 yeah. See, we don't discern who says it. I hear some people call me up. And they'll say to me, uh, I heard blah, 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 blah. And it's so wrong that you think their conscience would say, so I said, who said it? So-and-so said it. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> Just forget it. See, what is the source of your truth? Everybody says, I don't know the truth. I don't know what the church teaches. Oh, don't give me that malarkey. That's malarkey. If you want to know what the church teaches, you have all the documents. The Holy Father is out there saying something all the time. You can, you can find out what the church teaches at a drop of a hat. What you're trying to figure out, what somebody else says, and you can't discern what somebody else says. Find out. Make a comparison. The best way to judge some is by comparison. Find out what does the church say, the church, the magisterium. 
Now, this minister, this priest, this nun, this it, all these nuns and enneagrams, and that's really directing the people down a long, wide road down to you know where. There's no concept of grace or Jesus or redemption or suffering, nothing. You know what the church teaches. This is not in conformity with what the church teaches. So why is there a problem? And everywhere you go today, there's some little voice coming along with something new. And what did the Lord say? He said, and they will say on the last day, there he is. And there he is, and there he is. He said, don't pay attention to him. <coughs> Why is it we pay attention to every Tom, Dick, and Harry who thinks he's a theologian? Theologians sometimes know a lot about God, about him. Give me the theologian that not only knows about God, but knows God. Him I will believe. Because if he knows God, he will adhere to truth. And there will be no error in him. But if he doesn't know God, meaning he hasn't a prayerful life where he can experience God so that he can discern and he knows, not only does he have knowledge, he knows then if I have a discernment and I have a, a, a love for Jesus and I want to be holy, I am going to run to the truth. I seek the truth. Seek. What else? Knock. I have to ask. I have to seek. I have to knock. Well, if I'm just sitting there like a boobaloo, waiting for this avalanche of diverse doctrines and theology and philosophies, you're going to be a spiritual smorgasbord. See? And then you'll give little pickings to other people, and then they give little pickings to somebody else. You have nothing in the end. Nothing. Is there another question? I thought I had one. This is fun. Hello. We are taught to pray for people, mm -hmm. especially people who are living immoral lifestyles or not yeah, involved yeah. in the church or something like that, like St. Augustine's mother did for him. Yeah, yeah. How does my prayer work in someone else's life without violating their free will? Well, that's a good question. When Monica prayed for Augustine, she was not violating his free will. She was asking God to give him enough grace and never to cease uh, giving him the grace to listen, to listen, to open his heart to something other than his pleasures, his mistress, his, and all the other things he went in for. And so the, she constantly uh, asked God to open his heart so that he could exercise his will. Why? Because at that point, his will became enlightened. See? I have to have an enlightened conscience because I can run around saying, I got to obey my conscience. Well, then I'm obliged to have an enlightened conscience if I'm going to say that which means I'm obliged to seek the truth. But he never sought the truth, see? It's like um, somebody knocking, 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 and nobody opens the door, see? And Augustine's being steeped in all kinds of sin. See, all, all Monica did was open the door and allow him the opportunity to listen to St. Ambrose. And it was through what St. Ambrose said that this man, who was a great intellect, thought, ooh, I never knew that. See? Now, prayer is that vehicle. It's like, um, what do you call these things you put on doors? It's swingers. What do you, I don't know what they call them. Um, we got hundreds of them around here. Uh, you put them on the door, and you open the door, and it closes by itself. You know? She was the one that finally opened the door for him through 30 years of prayer. You opened the door. After that, you got to get out of the way. 
See? You open the door to a new light, a new truth, but the, that person still has the free will to say, I accept it or I don't. And after living such, a, uh, 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 Im such an immoral life for so many years, you know, you get sick of that. And some people have to get, that's a terrible thing, all the way down to, <laughs> there's no other place to go but up before they answer. And that's why we're obliged to pray for our neighbor. No matter how bad he is, no matter how terrible he is, no matter what, I'm obliged to pray for him all the time. Because I'm looking for a door to open. That one person who says a word, a sermon, something on television, something, just something, all the time something, that says, oh, I didn't know that. You'd be surprised how many Christians don't know Jesus loves them. Amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I talked to a CCD teacher years and years ago, and I said, oh, Jesus loves you. She looked kind of shocked, you know. I didn't say anything. A week later, she comes back and she says, I didn't know Jesus loved me. I said, what? She said, I didn't know it. I said, you teach CCD? She said, yes. Hey, what are you telling these kids? I said, what are you telling them? I got to open the door before I pile in all this doctrine. You know, <laughs> I have to know I am loved by a God who is infinite, who loved me before time began, who loved me consistently. I am open. See, so that's what prayer does. Intercessory prayer opens the door to the discouraged, sad, desolate soul. Nobody in deep sin is happy, but they could love the depths of their sin. That's that sad part. See. I found that a lot of people don't really seek happiness. They seek their own will. We live today in a battle of wills. The will of God and the will of Satan. We live in a day where we are saying, as he said in the beginning, I will not serve. And the Lord said he was a liar from the beginning. Please, look at the Lord tonight. Ask for his mercy and forgiveness and say, Lord, I will what you will. God bless you. We'll see you next week.